Hi, and welcome to Redmond's Reviews. I'm Chris Garlock, and I'm joined with Michael Redmond, uh, Nine Down Professional. Hi, Michael. Hello. Uh, I am in Washington, D.C. Michael is in Japan. This is a, a bit of a first for us, even though we did the, uh, the AlphaGo commentaries last year. It's, it's our first time uh, doing this kind of broadcast, so bear with us. Uh, it looks like uh, we're going to have some fun. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at some Master Games later on, but we wanted to start with a game that was just played a few days ago. Uh, in the European Professional Championship, uh, that, that Michael found a sort of some some master goish looking moves. I think you'd you'd say, right? Well, um, almost, yeah. They're they're actually <laughs> um, more human because they've been around for several years. Um, but they they are sort of the spirit of uh, what people are getting into with um, when they're emulating master in professional games nowadays. So why don't we talk a little bit about the uh, the two players? Uh, one is Alexander Dinerstein, who of course I know well, uh, and the other I believe is another Russian player, Artem. Yeah, both professionals in Europe. Of course, uh, Dinerstein was uh, he was a professional in Korea before mm -hmm. that, and uh, a fairly formidable player. He was he beat um, some top professionals in the world tournaments when he was in Korea, um, and then now he's back in Europe. Um, probably doing a lot of teaching, but he's also playing in the tournament, um, the professional tournaments there. And this was a tournament uh, last week. It was the second uh, annual uh, European Professional Championship. Six, it was either six or eight uh, of the professionals in Europe, which is great. They've got that many professionals uh, sort of yeah. in par uh, So very exciting stuff uh, over two days, uh, I believe it was. So why don't we uh, take a look and, uh, and jump right into uh, your analysis. Yeah, well, um, it's pretty obvious that it's not the normal opening <laughs> from the start. Um, but this is actually, it is not a move that AlphaGo or Master played. Um, because this was a move that uh, became famous when Cho U started playing it. He's one of the top Japanese players, and he's from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it's it's called by some the Cho U opening, or the Cho U Fuseki. And he played it um, almost pretty uh, constantly for, I'd say, several months or maybe about a year. And this and was, was This was about two or three years ago, I think. Okay. Uh, and, um, of course, uh, Alexander Dinerstein, he, he likes to play this kind of thing also. He likes to play something that's unexpected, and he likes to experiment with the opening. So he doesn't really need AlphaGo to, to start doing this kind of stuff. But there is this one move that uh, is actually a move that Master played um, in its in I think it was uh, about three of its sixty games, mm -hmm. um, and this peep um, on the outside of White's uh, one space jump here um, is generally considered to be a bad move. It has been played in professional games locally. It's taking a loss, and so I'll, I'll go into some to some some variations to show how it can be taking a loss. Like, usually white just connects here. And when this happens, um, black has um, pretty much lost the opportunity to jump into the 3-3 point later. Mm -hmm. Because when black does do that, um, the the peep that black has just played has become a terrible move. And I should because, mention, yeah. uh, just uh, folks to know, uh, we'll be releasing uh, Michael's SGF commentary of this game as well. So we won't be going into all the variations. Uh, we'll just be covering the main variations. So um, actually, we'll try and release it before we release the video so you can actually follow along at home. Sure. So we can see in this position that Black's peep on the outside has become a terrible move, exchanging for this move, which White really wants to play anyway. And the corner is not alive yet. So this is a variation that Black just has to disregard and, and just um, completely avoid the um, idea of jumping into the 3-3 point. Okay. Also, um, it also makes a difference when Black plays something like this, because at any point, White can play here. And if this uh, marked exchange was not on the board, then White's corner would still be um, open for invasion but with this exchange on the board it's a solid territory so again when black is trying to attack the upper left corner um the peep the marked exchange here is very bad for black you would just see an example of uh, aji keshi or where you just sort of remove a lot of possibilities in a position 
It would be called Aji Keshi, yeah, in the okay. same meaning, of course. Um, and so now to get to the, the good parts, um, when black plays this exchange, it makes a difference in the fighting on the left side. Okay. Uh, for instance, if um, let's just go into the game variation. Um, if white plays something like this on the left side, it's relatively easy for black to play on the top and um, surround white on the left side. Naturally, white's going to live on the left side, but black is, um, this works well with black's um, general idea because black is trying to make something in the center usually when black plays high moves like this. So it works well that black can sort of win the fight on the left side, um, giving white some territory, but getting the center um, and squeezing white a little bit on the left side. So okay. this is what black wants to do. And in this variation, black basically uh, really needs this exchange. This, uh, this mark stone here is working to help black um, curl around white on the top. And so that's a case where it works well. And when black has played uh, this high opening with stones way up away from the corners, uh, black really wants to have the op option of surrounding the center and at least the sides. And usually black is planning to give the corners to white, especially if white really tries to take them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, um, at this point, like if white wanted to take the lower left corner, uh, white would play something like this maybe. And after that, it's not so efficient for black to be playing something from this side because um, then this this stone on the fifth line, uh, this stone here would be sort of strange. It would it wouldn't be um, helpfully surrounding the left side. So this would not be so good, and it wouldn't really work with all those stones on the right side of the board. So what black wants to do is and just to probably and, yeah. And I just want to point out to the uh, looking at that move in that sequence is also an example of what folks call Tawari, which is sort of looking at if you roll it back, uh, like mm -hmm. in a normal situation, would you play that way? Yeah, I mean, basically the Tawari idea is that you take a position that would could happen um, else and otherwise, and then you can uh, get rid of a stone um, that you think might not be good. And that would be the marked stone in this position, um, which would be it would be better for black to have it uh, somewhere around here on the right. side. Right. Um, so that would be the, the Terwadi logic. Um, so actually black will not play that way. And we'll probably play just to sort of surround white in the corner, like something like this could happen, uh, where black is getting the outside. And of course, now the, the lower side and the right side of the board is looking like a huge black moyo. In return, white's getting a lot of territory in the corner. So it's very easy for white to take the territory this way um, and in that case, Black's strategy will be to surround the center and the sides. So that's that's why it's basically very important for Black to start out with the option of surrounding the center. And um, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, that works well with this stone here. Sorry, that, that should not be there. Yeah. Uh, so it, the idea of that Black is surrounding the center is going to work well with this move, and it makes it um, a possible move in this case. Mm -hmm. And so uh, locally, uh, black is playing moves that look sort of unreasonable or losing points. But in actuality, um, they work well with the overall position. So it makes it OK for black to be doing this. So I should have mentioned that uh, for this first one that we're doing, it's actually going to be fairly short. It should be about 15 minutes, uh, which means we're about halfway through. Uh, just a question for you. I mean, I think especially for amateurs, uh, this kind of wide open, you know, off the charts play can be kind of scary. But as you're saying, you know, professionals have, have, have played it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, Cho played it um, and it came as a big, he plays a lot of unusual openings. Like mm -hmm. he plays a lot of openings that are based on the five three point, which is pretty unusual nowadays. Um, but actually, um, he credited uh, So Yokoku, who is... Um, a player who was born in China and he's a Japanese pro, mm. um, another nine don. I think he's a nine don. Um, he credited So Yokoku with this this opening, mm. and um, he said that So Yokoku played it a long time ago when they were studying together. Um, I, they were both disciples of Ding Kaiho, mm -hmm. and so um, they were they were uh, friends. They've been friends for a long time. So he credited So Yokoku with it, and So Yokoku actually was playing this opening a lot at the same time. So um, Cho sort of beat him to the first game that was famous, but they were both playing this opening for about a year, I think. 
Mm-hmm. And then they both they both decided that it was, wasn't going to work, and they quit it. Apparently, and <laughs> it's it's really funny because uh, because they were so both so strong players, it was working to a certain extent. In that um, they had difficult games, but they managed to turn them around usually. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it wasn't a complete d- disaster for them. But um, the moment they stopped playing this opening. Most professionals just just quit at the same time. They decided that the verdict had come and it wasn't going to work. Well, one of the points that you were making when we were discussing uh, this game earlier is that uh, there's there's certainly no Josekis <laughs> for those first couple yeah. of black moves, of right? So, yeah. well, black is so far black is sort of playing a game plan up to this point, but black just doesn't know where white's going to play this move that's just showing right now, white twelve. Uh, White's invasion at this one was e4, um, but black has to be careful, uh, ready for a number of white moves that could happen. And so this is a point where it really it probably goes outside of black's experience too. Uh, when the moment white plays here, uh, white could have played a number of moves. I, I just I was showing you this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be it could be here. This is this is a move that was tried a lot against this. Uh, white could just go for the star point. And these are all moves that are feasible. Like this one would be something like this, and White would be playing something towards the side, maybe like this. Mm-hmm. And again, White White's going to get the corner, but Black is going to get the side. And and the difference between this variation and uh, this variation um, is that in this variation, both sides have very solid shapes. Like White has the corner, and Black also has a very good connection on the outside, and a fairly solid grasp of the lower side in the, because of that. Whereas in this case, uh, oh, sorry, it's not that one, this one. In this case, both black and white have very loose shapes. Like uh, white has the weakness in the corner at the 3 3 point, which black might be taking advantage of later. Like if, right. black, um, if black plays, probably would play another move to set off the side. And um, you could say this white group is not completely alive yet. So white would be thinking of maybe this would be a defensive move, which would be not so interesting, but it, this would be one way white could handle it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have just a couple of minutes before we wrap up this initial one. Um, did you have any sort of general comments uh, or advice for those of you out there thinking about trying this? Because this was, you know, as I said, it was a European professionals game. I think probably a lot of people, you know, it was broadcast the games uh, certainly on our website. Um, and as again, Michael's commentary uh, is going to be available uh, with more details on this, which is why we're not going into a lot of the variations now. But just sort of general comments or, or uh, concerns. Well, I do want to go into one final point then, um, because it's black thirteen is an important move too. Uh-huh. Um, it, it's base, it, black has to keep with the strategy of going from the sides a lot, um, or at least for the first move. Um, and when white plays something like this that is an attempt to erase black's center, sometimes black will um, jump into the corner then. So this is what happened right. in this game. And black was playing a very flexible strategy, like um, if we just go a few moves ahead. We can see that uh, pretty quickly black sort of changes this into a game where black is taking territory. And um, actually has a lot of territory. If we're counting um, the lower side, black gets most of the lower side here. Um, this was sort of fast forward, but black has a lot of territory on the lower side and some territory on the left side. And um, because white has p- invested a lot of moves to erase the center, um, that means that black has got some territory, um, some extra territory. Black actually has a lead of territory because the only territories that we can call whites are the lower left and the upper left corners, and they're both relatively small, whereas black has a fairly large territory on the lower side. And at this por- point of the game, um, it's probably pretty even. Um, white, uh, I think white messed up in the variation after this, but I won't go into it today. Um, but I'll put it in the SDF file. Uh, cool. But it's, it's, it's interesting to see how this, because this game starts so far away from the corners, sometimes um, sometimes black will switch it around to take territory like this. So that's, that's the interesting uh, part of the, you have to be flexible like this sometimes. So that's the the lesson of the day is is uh, creativity and flexibility. Mm-hmm. Yes, cool. innovation. Yeah, innovation. 
You like yes. innovation. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for this uh, sort of teaser edition of uh, Redmond Reviews, as we're calling it uh, at the moment. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Michael. I'm excited about doing these. And I should just mention, um, we hope to uh, be able to start releasing uh, our full series. Um, Michael's going to be looking at the uh, recently played uh, Master Games. He sort of picked out a number that he's uh, particularly interested in. We'll be following the same format. We'll be doing a little bit longer. I think we're looking for about 30 minutes uh, per game, uh, but also releasing SGF files with more detailed commentaries. So thanks yes. for watching and thank you, Michael. Thank you.